If this stretch of tortuous mountain trails could be replaced by a modern highway, where now only pack trains could pick their plodding way, China would have a practical supply route to Burma and the sea. Several internationally known firms of engineers were called in to do the job. They said the work might be completed in six or seven years if China could supply them with the most modern machinery. But China didn't have the modern machinery, nor did she have the six or seven years. So she began building the road with her bare hands. By thousands, by tens of thousands, by hundreds of thousands, they toiled at the back-breaking task of carving this desperately needed supply line out of the reluctant mountains. their toil and their sweat, they created the Burma Road, not in six or seven years, but in less than 12 months, a monument to the new spirit, to the new China. As soon as it was completed, the road went into immediate service. By thousands, the truck shuttled back and forth between its terminals climbing to nearly 10,000 feet, around hairpin curves, along the edges of sheer precipices, where passing trucks had barely one foot of clearance. And the blood plasma of new supplies flowed steadily over China's lifeline to the sea, protected by Colonel Chenault's incredible flying tigers. But Chinese sacrifice cannot be measured only in miracles of construction. It must be counted, too, in the tragedy of destruction. For while still the Burma Road was being built, the invading Jap armies had fanned out and straddled fully two-thirds of the railroad lines of the country. In the summer of 1938, they set out to capture the remaining one-third, starting with the vital railroad junction at Chengchow. Chengchow is situated on the banks of the Yellow River, China's sorrow. Originally, the river flowed from Chengchow southeastward to the Yellow Sea. But nearly a century ago, a great flood abruptly changed its course, swinging it far to the north. For generation upon generation, as the spring floods rushed down to the sea, thousands of Chinese worked on the dikes to hold the river in its new course, protecting their homes and their crops. Now, as the Japs advanced on Chengchow, the Chinese blew up the southern dike of the Yellow River, thus loosing a flood between themselves and the Japs. Once more, the river flowed in its old course, forming a barrier which to this day has prevented the Jap from entrenching himself in this area. Thus, once more, with no thought of the human sacrifice of the material cost, the Chinese traded space for time. And the Chinese had still other tricks to pull from their patched and faded sleeves. You will notice that this map of Jap conquests doesn't look like the military maps you have seen in the previous films. By all military standards, it should have looked like this which is the way the Japs wanted it to look. But the Japanese were learning that the occupation of Chinese cities and control of Chinese rivers and railroads still was far from meaning the subjugation of China. For the Chinese had formed themselves into guerrilla bands trained to harass the Jap forces. These guerrillas were mostly farmers 
who had stayed behind on the land when the great migration to the west took place. Peaceful farmers one day, deadly fighters the next. They made an unpredictable and uncontrollable enemy. The Japs held the lines of communications, but in the pockets thus formed, these unconquerable guerrillas constantly sniped at the Jap invaders. When the Japs tried to annihilate them, they disappeared, only to reappear in another pocket. with speed and surprise, they ambushed enemy patrols. And the Japanese were fighting more than the Chinese people. They were fighting the Chinese land. The great distances, the rivers, the floods, the swamps and marshes. These two were enemies that defied the Jap war machine. The giant back Japan intended to ride to world conquest was proving to be a bucking bronco. Phase two of the Tanaka plan had bogged down in what the Japs still referred to as the China incident. This left them in a fateful quandary. Phase two of the Tanaka plan was still incomplete, but phase three and phase four could no longer be delayed. In Russia, the overwhelming German offensive was taxing Russia's military capacity to the limit, removing any Japanese fear of Russian interference. Britain, after the sledgehammer blows of Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain, was left groggy and militarily almost exhausted. Her navy scattered across the seas, guarding her lifeline of supplies. But here in America, we were finally awakening to our danger and taking steps to protect ourselves. We had appropriated funds for the construction of a two-ocean navy, and our army was rapidly expanding. If the ultimate objectives of the Tanaka plan were to be achieved, now was the moment to strike. Now, when Russia was otherwise occupied. Now, before Britain could recuperate. Now, before we could gather too much strength. So the Japs made a fateful decision. They would embark on phase three and phase four, the conquest of the Indies in the United States without waiting to complete phase two, the conquest of China. Thus, to paralyze American power in the Pacific, without warning, as they have always struck, they struck again. According to all the rules, China's position should now be greatly improved. For in her war with Japan, China now had fighting allies. Ourselves, the British, the Dutch. But it didn't work that way for China. For in those tragic early months of 1942, when we sustained defeat after defeat at the hands of our common enemy, China endured the worst setback of all. Out of our defeats, China lost the Burma Road. 